Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. And it's been a pretty exciting February so far. We are celebrating amazing women in science, adventure, exploration, uh, and conservation. We've had a great series of hangouts so far, and there's still many, many more to come. So thank you for joining us today. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Megan Cook. She's an ocean explorer, and she takes robots deep into the Earth's oceans to look at animals and landscapes that have never been seen by humans before. She coordinates the Ocean Exploration Trust Outreach and Education programs, and she works beside the legendary explorer and discoverer the Titanic, Dr. Robert Ballard, uh, to inspire audiences all over the world. Um, she's been honored as a Mission Blue Young Explorer, and she was also a North America Rolex Scholar in 2012. And I've also been told to add that she's an Oregon State Beaver and an intercollegiate polo player. So Megan, it's so great to have you joining us for a hangout today. Thanks so much, Joe. I'm thrilled to join you. And hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and chatting with me today. Um, and thanks everyone also who's watching on YouTube. I am so thrilled to get to talk to you about the ocean and about the path that I've taken to get to this career. Um, I have a lot of great pictures, so I'm going to share the screen with you and sort of be back to talk to you um, face to face in just a little bit. But let me click over to some of those photos to tell you a little bit about how I got started um, in the path that I have followed. Now, I'm talking to you right now from uh, a little tiny town called Friday Harbor, Washington. And Friday Harbor, Washington is way up in the northwest corner of the uh, northwest state of the U.S. And, uh, but this is not where I originally grew up. I grew up in a state called Idaho, which is in the desert. Just a moment, I am having trouble getting this full screen. Uh, just to check in, Megan, when you did the screen share, did you pick the application window or the whole screen? I picked the whole screen. Okay. Um, sometimes if you just jump out and jump back in, sometimes that uh, sorts out the problem. There we it's go. technology. You never know what it's going to do. Never know, indeed. Can you see it now? You're back with us now, yep. Fantastic. Do you have a map of Idaho? Oh, try, uh, try popping back in the screen share. We still have you on screen. How's that look? Nope. Hmm. It's interesting because we just... Oh, no. We did just give this a try. We did That's just right. give it a test. Wonderful. It worked out nicely for us. In science, is sometimes you get to troubleshoot because everything doesn't go right on the first try. In fact, I would say most of the time things don't go perfectly the first time around. So give it one more try here. It could just be the double screen, too. Sometimes. Uh, the hangouts can get confused, but we did have it, and it was working just fine when you're sharing the video. <clears throat> but that's okay. We can give you a second to troubleshoot, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it wouldn't be technology if it didn't throw something at us in the middle of a hangout. Exactly, exactly. There we go. I see me now. Looks like we're getting a good start. How do we feel about that one? And we have a map. We're in we business. Have a map. Success. Success. Wonderful. Well, thanks for hanging with me there. Now, I wanted to show you this map because this is a place where I grew up. It's a the town of Boise, Idaho, and it is... Um, as you can tell there, not rich in ocean. Boise is in the desert. Uh, and I didn't actually see the ocean until I was in high school. And yet I decided that this is where my passions really lie. And that came from a really great teacher. So when we're all done today, I hope you will high five your teacher for introducing you 
uh, to this program and letting you spend class today talking with me because if it wasn't for a great teacher who read us a lot of ocean storybooks, I don't know that I would have captured my imagination to know that the ocean is a field with so many different careers in it and so many interesting things left to learn. This, I found this picture and wanted to share it with you because this was me shortly after I decided I wanted to become an ocean professional. And this was uh, a school program and I got to be a rain cloud. So you could see by, by age seven or so, I was pretty into this whole ocean idea. I ended up going to college to study biology and chemistry uh, at Oregon State University, as we mentioned, because I really liked animals. Those were the things that were in most of the storybooks that I read about the ocean and were the ways that I first got fascinated with the ocean. Now, being a biologist, I started to get to go awesome places and spend time on boats. But as a biologist, it's not all time on boats. I also started to spend a lot of time working in spreadsheets. Now, I share that with you because that's important to love both aspects of it, the adventure, but also the data. We got to start asking really interesting questions, and then we'd go out into the world and start collecting information to see what those patterns looked like, to see what the data would tell us about our questions. I, in my early career, I also started to work on our own human impacts on the ocean. I studied things like marine debris, which is trash in the ocean, and also invasive species, all those woolly creep, um, long tendrils that you see on the left of that image, those are an invasive plant, an invasive algae that I did work on in Hawaii trying to take out of the ocean. It was something that lived in the ocean far away, but after it had been in, introduced to the Hawaii environment, it started to take over coral reefs. So I wanted to know more about our ocean planet, not only how it naturally worked, but also the kinds of impacts we were having. And the more that I learned about our oceans, the more I wanted to start telling ocean stories. And my career took a big turn at that point because I realized that as much as I loved playing in the ocean and studying the ocean and asking good questions about it and collecting good data and creating change um, and doing the small things that I could do to help the ocean, what I really loved was helping other people get excited about those same things and telling stories about how they could get involved and get fascinated by our planet and get involved with helping protect it. So as a science communicator, I started working in films. Um, that's a great way to reach a whole lot of people and also taking people into the ocean. I even became a submarine pilot. This is the Atlantis number 14, the world's largest passenger submersible that I was able to co-pilot and take people physically into the ocean. But with all the scuba diving I did and all of the work that I'd done so far, I still didn't feel like I was really getting a whole grasp of our ocean planet. You can spin a globe around and have it land at a spot like this where you can see almost no land. Our planet is a water planet, covered 71% um, of the surface with water. Seven out of 10 darts you'd throw at a map would land in the ocean. Now, Although our planet is blue and we've known that for a long time, we still have an enormous amount to understand about our ocean. In fact, 95% of the ocean remains unexplored. I work for a team called Ocean Exploration Trust now, who are a nonprofit organization who are working on carving that number down. We live on a beautiful blue planet and we want to understand what is in those depths what all those resources look like. Now, 95% is a huge number to wrap your brain around. How can we be uh, in this amazing age of technology and still know so little about our oceans? So I need some help breaking that idea down. So let me walk you through a visual like this. I live near Seattle, so I'm going to use a ruler of the Space Needle, which is a very famous, iconic, um, building on our landscape here. And it is 200 meters tall. It's a very good ruler. The math works out nice and easily. Now scuba diving would take you part way to the depths of a space needle, but only to about 40 meters as it's, as it's traditionally uh, dove. So just to walk you through that, if we went down one space needle in the plant into our oceans, the ocean would start to get dark. 
If we go down two space needles, you are entirely in the dark, 400 meters. Animals at these depths start creating their own light because it is so dark. Um, they need to find, uh, make their own light to find food or to lure their friends together to form communities. You don't reach what we call the deep sea, the area that I do most of my research and work, until you are five space needles down. Now we can march 20 space needles down, and that gets you to the average ocean depth, 4,000 meters. But our ocean is far deeper than that. At the deepest point, which is called Challenger Deep, our ocean is almost 11,000 meters down. That's 54 and a half space needles, if you're trying to count on your screen right there. So with, I hope that puts it in a little bit of context. We have a massive, massive ocean planet and so much left to discover. Now, I don't do this work alone. I work with a great team that we call the core of exploration. These are professionals and students from all around the world, 44 countries and over a thousand people in our core of exploration who all share a passion for finding, answering new questions and finding out new things about our planet. They all have different backgrounds. Um, they all have different accents. And they come from, and they bring their unique backgrounds and those special skills together to be able to do this work. No single person could do this alone. And nobody is a strong enough expert to be able to be a singular force of ocean exploration. We are all stronger when we work together. Just like a sports team, you need people who specialize in different things to come together to make an ocean exploration team. Now I'm gonna show you a little bit of what our core of exploration gets to see when we're in the deep sea. Now to help you understand our field a little bit more, I want to share with you that a lot of our planet doesn't even have great maps yet. This is a map of Seattle. If you've looked at a map of your own hometown, you could find your house, your friend's house, maybe your favorite restaurant where you like to spend time or go get something to eat. But in the ocean, if we wanted to look at it like a map for all the animals and types of life and uh, interesting features that are there, the map would look more like this for the city of Seattle. In many places on our planet, you can think of sort of a Lego block map where each block is sometimes as wide as five kilometers by five kilometers. If you were looking at this Lego block map, you might have a very hard time finding your friend's house or your favorite place to hang out after school. So when we go to explore the ocean using our ship, Exploration Vessel Nautilus, uh, she's 200 feet long or 70 meters, and 50 people go to sea at one time out of the core of exploration. And when we start exploring, we use a tool on the bottom of the ship called the multi-beam mapping system that sends sound down to the seafloor. And like the premise of an echo or a fish finder, you send the sound down and you count how long it takes the sound to bounce back off the seafloor and come back. Except instead of sending one ping of sound down, it sends hundreds of beams. 
So together, a computer program can put together these landscapes underneath the ocean. If you've never thought of it before, the ocean has mountains, it has open plains, it has cliffs and rolling hillsides. There are all the landscapes that we have here on Earth underneath the surface of the water, still waiting to be discovered. If you have ever wanted to name your own mountain, let me suggest becoming an ocean explorer. There are 13,000 mountains that are a kilometer and a half tall still missing from our maps. And if you uh, are the person who maps them, you have the opportunity to name them. This is a new mountain we named this year, uh, or we discovered this year, not yet named, off the coast of Baja, Mexico. And this is more than two miles tall. This is 3,500 meters tall and wasn't on the map until we mapped it. Once we map uh, things on the seafloor, I work with a team of robots. These are my coworkers. We call them Hercules, the yellow one in the front, and Argus in the back. These are each about the size of a minivan, and they're equipped with all kinds of interesting things like arms, so we can collect things like rocks or creatures from the seafloor. They have different types of scientific instruments like cameras, thermometers. They can measure the pressure around them, the salinity. We can capture water or all types of different scientific samples that help us understand these brand new places that we're going to. We send the ROVs to places humans have never been before on planet Earth. And because they are connected with cameras and connected to the ship and the whole world, I want to invite you to come exploring with me. Because everything these robots see and everything I get to experience as an explorer on the ship, you can experience too. Because the vehicles are tethered like a dog on a leash to the ship, they can send their signal up to the ship, up to space, down to the east coast of the United States where we have our equivalent of NASA's Houston, and we send that feed all around the world online on the website Nautilus Live. You can see all the videos from our explorations there as well as send in your questions so that when you're not chatting with me here in your classroom, you could still talk to an expert in ocean exploration and they'll help you understand what is that animal or what type of volcano are we seeing right now? We've moved all around the world with our ship the last few years, starting in the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, the Aegean, across the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, as far south as Ecuador in South, in south America, as far north as Canada. And this year, the ship will be going to Hawaii for the very first time. Now, I want to quickly show you just a couple of my favorite things we've seen along the way. This is a hydrothermal vent. It's a place where the skin of the planet is breaking open, where the plates, tectonic plates, are moving apart, and uh, lava, magma underneath the rocks is heating up water and sending it like a geyser. This is like Old Faithful underwater, except the chimneys can be seven stories tall and as hot as 325 degrees Celsius. That was as hot as this chimney was, and that wasn't even the world record. These are amazing landscapes that think, seem like they should be on a faraway planet. In fact, until the 1970s, we didn't even know life could exist at the bottom of the planet, at the bottom of the oceans like this. And now it's helping us look for different types of life on different planets around the solar system. Totally incredible to be able to learn that much from our oceans right in our backyard. We also have the chance to look at history as ocean explorers. This was a World War II aircraft carrier which had been intentionally sunk off the American West Coast and largely forgotten about for 60 years. This ship had a storied history throughout um, global uh, politics and war, and yet now it lives a new life in the biological and geologic sense that these white vases that are all over them are glass sponges, and it's now home to all types of animals. Right here in an old airplane, which was a total surprise for us to find on this ship, um, we found interesting animals like those tinopores, which are the, the glittery, glow-in-the-dark um, jellyfish-looking animals, and fish, crabs, amazing diversity of life. So we can tell stories about ourselves by looking at the ocean. 
Sometimes we also just get to find the cutest animals that you could possibly come up with. This was a discovery we made, uh, a googly eye stubby squid, a known species that we found off the coast of California. You can see it changing color here in the left side of your screen and will come into the center of your screen. This is an amazing predator of his or her environment. So exploring the ocean is also a chance to meet animals that you may never encounter otherwise. The googly eye stubby squid is pretty fierce. It's able to stick out sort of a snot jacket, a mucusy jacket around its skin and it can sort of wiggle down into the sand and stick sand to that sticky jacket and lay in wait for any type of little creature it wants to eat as it goes by. Then it can slip out of that mucus jacket, jump out as an ambush predator. So this is a, a pretty big bad animal in his or her home neighborhood. But when you see a 5,000 pound robot come into your neighborhood, it turns out that this is the face that you make. Now I wanna invite you to come exploring with us this year on Nautilus Live, we are going to be moving all the ship all around the Eastern Pacific, and you can tune in online or on social media with me um, and with our team. But before we get to your questions, I just want to tell you that this is a wide, wide world to keep exploring. There has never, ever been a generation that will be better explorers of this planet than yours. I think sometimes if you were to open your history book and find me a picture of an explorer, you might find somebody with one of those silly raccoon hats and it would probably be a boy and uh, it would be someone from like olden times because we sometimes think that that's what explorers look like. But we have better tools and technology now than ever before and we live in an interconnected world where people can work together on their ideas. Exploring our oceans is a really important thing for everyone to do around the world because it's very hard to manage the resources of our oceans until we know what's there. And with 95% of the oceans still unexplored, there are many big questions to answer about how we can sustainably take care of our planet, how we can responsibly use the resources that are there, and how we can ensure that the whole planet is able to keep um, thriving and surviving on a planet that really, instead of being Earth, should maybe be called ocean. Now, let me get back out of screen sharing here, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have. All right, Megan, that was awesome. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that world with us, sharing what you get to do every day. It must be pretty incredible knowing on any given day that you're out on the Nautilus, you're seeing things that no other human has seen before. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, so classrooms it. definitely need to. Yeah, and we love it because the second I see it, you can see it too. And that makes it really powerful. I get to be an ocean explorer, but you are every bit the ocean explorer that I am also. All right, awesome. Well, I think it's time to meet some classrooms. What we'll do is we will swing through each classroom once and meet the classroom and get a question. And then we'll open it up at the end uh, and see if there's a few more questions to wrap up the Hangout. So just a quick shout out to the classrooms watching live on YouTube. There's a YouTube chat sidebar. If you let us know where you're watching from, we'll give you a shout out. And if you have a question, don't hesitate to put it in the chat sidebar. So here we go. Let's meet our first classroom. So we are going to go to Miss Lindsay's class, grade four, fives, and sixes in Barry's Bay, Ontario, in Canada. Let me turn your microphone on. How are we doing today, Barry's Bay? Hi, Barry's Bay. What question can I answer for you? Uh, I have one question. Um, where do you guys mostly research all of the ocean stuff in? Like, where do you research mostly and where you do your stuff? Where do we research? Where do we research mostly? So we've gotten to in all kinds of different oceans. We mostly research in that totally dark part of ocean where you're down into the deep sea. So sort of five of those buildings stacked up. Um, so we call that below a thousand meters and shallower than 4,000 meters because the robots can't go any deeper than that. 
But we work with scientists from all around the world and they get to suggest their ideas. In a lot of ways, we work together to say, um, all the scientists need to come together and tell us the areas that are the most important to explore first. We have so much left to explore that you could sort of put the robots in anywhere and say you're seeing something new. But we wanna be able to help scientists all around the world get good information that will help them follow up with more questions and more research. Such a good question. All right, let's jump to another classroom. Let's go. Let's go this time to Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. We've got a grade three classroom with Mrs. Runka. Let me turn your microphone on. How are we doing grade threes? Good. Okay, Rowan, what would you like to ask? Come over, come over here. What would you like to ask? Has anybody ever been down the Mariana Trench? That's a great question. Off of our group, no. We send the robots down instead of sending people down just because people can't stay down as long as robots can. Robots don't need to eat or sleep or go to the bathroom. But there have been three people who have been to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. The first two went in 1964, and then someone went back in 2012. So I would love to go down to the deep ocean, but in the meantime, we'll send the robots. But if you'd like to go down there, I think that's a great thing for you to do. All right, great question. Uh, let's jump now to Mrs. Gasper's class. Grade four or five is joining us in Maple, Ontario, here in Canada. And your microphone is coming on. There. How's it going? <laughs> All right, go ahead with the question. Uh, what bodies of water have you explored? What bodies of water have we explored? Great question. We've explored the Black Sea, the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea, which is sort of like a little arm of the Mediterranean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Pacific Ocean. We crossed into the uh, Pacific through the Panama Canal in 2015. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest ocean in the world, so we'll be in that one for a little while, I think. All right, let's see. Let us go to Mrs. Barnes' group this time. So it's it's a group of several classrooms in San Antonio, Texas. Let me turn your mic on. How are we doing, Texas? What was the hardest part of getting to where you are now? Great question. What was the hardest part? I think one of the most challenging parts um, is, is knowing that it's not a straight line from one idea to the next. When I first got started, I wanted to study fish. And I studied fish for a while, and I loved that. And then I got excited about another idea. And so I think the challenge sometimes is um, being comfortable with saying, I'm also excited about this, so I'm going to go in that direction for a while, and knowing that um, it sometimes meant that my job went a little bit like this, like now I was studying those plants, then I was being a scuba diver, then I was working on underwater movies, and now I'm working in the deep sea. But I know that each one of those steps really taught me a lot and helped me get a more clear idea of what I wanted to do in the future. So, so sometimes the challenge was just knowing that it was okay to not know exactly what I wanted to do, but being willing to chase after those passions when they when they'd show up and do the hard work that it took, you know, to, you know, nobody handed anyone a spot on this ship. Everyone worked hard and studied hard in their own fields and their own winding paths to get where we are now. All right, I have a question from uh, Mrs. Rose's class. So they're, they can hear us just fine, but their mic isn't cooperating right now, but I can introduce them anyway. So they are joining us from, uh, Easton in the uh, United States. Um, they're a grade seven classroom. And they're wondering when you're planning to improve your robots or are you planning to improve your robots so they can go deeper? And has Nautilus ever discovered a new species? Three, two great questions. Uh, we would love to have the robots be um, able to dive a little deeper, but it's not in our current plan. Like I showed you on that, on that chart, 50% of the ocean, half of the ocean, 
um, just the way an average is, half is shallower and half is deeper than the average depth. And we built them to go to that average depth. So we're able to explore half of the world's oceans right now. Um, with 95% unexplored, we have kind of a long way to go until we run out of ocean that we can explore with our current robots. These robots are also um, really specially designed to the tune of multiple million dollars each. So um, we don't currently have plans to make them deeper, but there are deeper diving robots with different organizations around the world. So it's a small group and we get to work together. So we can sometimes send a different group organization to one interesting site and we'll work at another. Discovering new species is also a great question. Uh, we have discovered some new species, a couple of different types of sponges. But one of the exciting things about our work is that um, we're going totally into the unknown. And when you're going into the unknown, naming a species can be really hard because you have to know that it's not a blonde, brunette, redhead sort of version of a different animal that you've already seen. You have to know that it's enough variation um, to be specifically different. One of the most exciting things um, on this to this question to me is when we get to expand the range of an animal and that means that we've someone has named that animal and found it in one part of the ocean and we get to find it another part of the ocean sometimes that's at a spot that's deeper sometimes it's a spot that's an entire ocean away when we were in ecuador we found a, a worm called a pelagic squid worm and it had these iridescent these shiny um, paddle fan legs all down it and it was a worm swimming up in the middle of the water and we stopped and we didn't know what it was and we called on our team of experts and we collaborated all together and we learned that that animal had been recently named just a couple years before but it had been named in the philippines almost a third of the planet away so now we know they live in those two spots do they live everywhere else we don't know yet we'll have to keep exploring so sometimes those range expansions are just as exciting as naming something brand new. All right, great question. And a very good point. Everyone always thinks about the new species, but finding the range of the species, especially somewhere as big as the ocean, is pretty important too. Yeah. All right, uh, Mrs. Evans class, we're going to Haynes, Oregon now. Let me turn your microphone on. And how's everyone doing in Oregon? Hello. Excellent. And there are a grade five, six group joining us today. So go ahead with a question. Um, that's you, Anne. Anne. How, many years, Anne. how many years of college did you go to? And what degree did you have to have a degree? What class did you have to have a degree for? Oh, that's a great question. I just went to four years of school so far. I just have a, I have a bachelor's of science in biology. I have a minor in chemistry. And, a, and an option in marine biology. Um, an important thing to know about our team, there are um, about 50 people on board the ship at any one time. Out of those 50 people, maybe only three of them have PhDs. It's a diverse team that's needed to run a ship. Um, and we work 24 hours a day on the ship. So we divide up into three groups, three watches. And each of those watches um, has a leader, and that's someone who has a PhD. Often, they're directing the objectives of the dive, making sure the ROVs stay on schedule. But if everyone had had a very specific academic focus, like a PhD, you may not have someone who's skilled with driving the ship, um, knowing how to navigate the robots together, knowing how to work the video cameras. Um, we wouldn't have anyone training with us. So within every single watch team, we have students. Once you're a college student, you can come out onto the ship with us. We bring out students studying seafloor mapping, ocean science, piloting ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, those robots, or the filmmaking, storytelling aspects of video engineering. How do you get video from the bottom of the ocean to my cell phone in under 30 seconds? The people who get to study that. So we have people all across the spectrum, people who went to technical school, community college, university, graduate schools, um, all the way uh, through the entire range, all on board the ship at one time. Great question. All right. Yes, definitely a good question. And then another really great point, because there's so many different paths you can take 
um, to get into ocean exploration. There is no one path. Everybody can take a different one. There'll be twists, there'll be turns. There's different careers you can have. So anybody who says there's nothing left to explore or discover uh, has no idea what they're talking about. All right, our final classroom who's joining us live, let me just move over there, there we go, are joining us from Alston, Ontario. Uh, I believe they're a grade four class with Mrs. Uh, McKeg. Let me turn her microphone on. All right, is it grade four today, am I right? Four and five, yep. Four and five, what? awesome. What is the tallest mountain you've seen in the ocean? Ooh, great question. Oh, um, hmm. Tallest one I have specifically seen. You know, you may have me stumped. That one in Mexico, I showed you that one that uh, people have started calling Sea Star Mountain because it has the five points. Um, that sea mount is a couple miles tall, and that's very, very tall. Um, but I used to live in Hawaii, and the island of Hawaii is actually a mountain in the ocean. And that one is many thousands of meters taller than that. It just, instead of, we often think about mountains on land, like a, if you were to draw me a volcano, you might draw something like this. In the ocean, many of the uh, sea mounts or many of the very tall mountains are much flatter because the uh, lava's oozed out and gone slowly down the sides. We call them shield volcanoes. So, um, Although it's a little bit of a, you know, a funny exception, I might say that the tallest mountain I've seen in the ocean is, is the island of Hawaii, rising all the way from the seafloor, all the way up, and then sticking just a little bit out into the air. All right, very cool. Good answer. Um, so we do have lots of classrooms joining us live, um, and we do have something coming in from our uh, YouTube uh, chat sidebar. So we've got a grade four class from Arizona. And then they've got a little two-parter here. So uh, have you ever explored ancient ruins with the ROVs? And how long have you been doing your work? Uh, great question. Yes, we have explored a lot of ancient, ancient shipwrecks. Um, when we were working over in the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and the Aegean Sea, uh, one of the things we were trying to explore there was tracing where ancient ships used to go. And you know, in the ocean, you don't have a road per se, but you do have places where more boats tend to go, where the wind blows if you're sailing or nearby in between ports. If you wanna go from point A to point B, you would drive along the same route. And one of the ways you can trace back ancient history in the ocean is by looking for boats that didn't make it the whole way and are sort of shipwrecks dotting the seafloor. So during that time, we were exploring a lot of ancient shipwrecks and ancient shipwrecks often look like um, piles of amphora, piles of clay jars, because the clay jars don't get eaten by any animals in the deep sea or they don't um, break down in the same way with the chemistry. So we were able to find um, many, many ancient shipwrecks um, just by looking for those piles of amphora on the seafloor. That's a great um, other pathway into ocean science is uh, looking at the history of our oceans. People, we've been explorers as long as there have been humans on this planet. And so um, looking at the archaeology or the maritime history is a really exciting thing to do. I wasn't personally on any of those expeditions, but I was watching online. That's when I first saw Nautilus and I saw them discover this ancient shipwreck and realized that Yes, those scientists were there in the moment, but I was watching it on a big screen and I felt like I was there at that very same moment. That shipwreck is called Nidos X for the Nidos region of Greece. Um, it doesn't have a more specific name than that, but that one's always near and dear to my heart um, as a result. This will be, for your second part of your question, this will be my sixth season of exploration with the Nautilus team. I got involved first through one of our education programs, which I'll just share with you, um, you never get invited onto a ship unless you apply. One of the great lessons of my life in working in this field is putting myself out there for opportunities, even if they sometimes seem like a long shot. This was so amazing to me, and I wanted to be part of it after seeing that shipwreck. Um, and I wasn't sure if I would be the perfect fit 
or if there are maybe other people who are a better fit, but I knew that I was that excited enough to put myself out there and, and jump over that moment of fear. And after getting involved that first year through the education program um, on the ship, I've been back every single year and became a staff member after that. All right, awesome. Thank you for that question, uh, grade fours in Arizona. So we have a few more minutes uh, before the end of the Hangout. I know there's gonna be tons of questions, so maybe uh, if classrooms do have extra questions after we do wrap up, if you send them to me, I bet you I can send them to Megan and I'm sure she'd send back uh, some answers for us. Absolutely. But for now, let's watch and look down at the cameras and if you have a question, give me a wave and we'll visit a couple more classrooms before we sign off for today. So, all right, I see uh, Miss Lindsay's class is the first one to wave. So your microphone is on. Um, have you ever thought of writing a book? Wow, great question. Um, I, I have now. Um, I would love to write a book, but uh, I'll put that on my to-do list. All right. Uh, looks like uh, lots of waving in Mrs. Gasper's class. Let me turn the microphone on. Um, my question is, have you ever um, found out the answers of Marianne, no, um, the Bermuda Triangle? Because I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I'm not a specific expert on the Bermuda Triangle, but I can tell you there are a few things that tend to cause big storms in the ocean. And big storms are a big reason why ships sink. Um, it is when cold water and warm water run into each other. Um, and also something that's not so good for ships are reefs or sandbars that might get in your way if you're trying to move a ship through. Uh, the Bermuda area, the Bermuda Triangle, has a lot of cold water and warm water mixing, which causes big storms, and a lot of sandbanks and, and coral areas. So there's some research out right now that says there are actually not more shipwrecks there than anywhere else in the ocean. There are a million shipwrecks that have not been found in our ocean yet. So if you're interested in shipwrecks, that you can search for shipwrecks all around the world. Anywhere that ships have been going for the entire history of humans, you can find traces of our history there. So uh, while there are lots, and they're very famous in the Bermuda Triangle, there are lots more that are all over as well. So I, I hope that'll be enough to get you started doing some more research about it, because I'm not an expert on that specific area. All right, but a very good answer and some very excellent points. Uh, Miss Evans' class. Uh, let me turn your microphone back on in Oregon. There we go. All right. What is your favorite um, marine life that you found? And, and if you found any marine life besides sponges? Oh, yeah. We found all kinds of marine life. Sharks, fish, crabs, giant lobsters. One of my favorites is uh, called the deep sea isopod. And um, you guys know roly polies. Some people call them pill bugs. Um, they're usually, you know, about the size of your pinky nail. In the deep sea, um, deep sea isopods, roly-poly bugs, get to be about the size of a rugby ball. They're bigger than your face. I think they look like spaceships because they fly through the midwater by paddling their legs underneath, sort of doggy paddle style, except they have lots of sets of legs. So you can go onto Nautilus Live and see deep sea isopod videos. They're definitely one of my favorites. Um, I also love the moment when our ROV met a sperm whale. That's the largest creature we've ever encountered. We were hovering in the midwater, collecting some chemistry samples, um, just suctioning up some water, and all of a sudden this teenage boy sperm whale came diving down and circled around and around and around the vehicle. You can see that one on Nautilus Live too. That totally stunned me. I was on board for that one. We had never expected to see anything that big that close to the ROVs. I was actually jumping on the couch. That's how excited I was on the ship. So check out that video. I highly recommend it. All right. And oh, there we go. It looks like Mrs. Barnes' group is waving to me. So let's turn their mic on. Um, under all the pressure in the deep sea, how do your robots survive? It's a great question. We have to specifically design them to handle all of that pressure. Um, many of the things end, end up, rather than being filled with air, like, let's see, I have a coffee cup right here. So 
inside this coffee cup is just air. And if you have pressure squeezing in all around it, the air isn't very strong to resist it and it can get crunched. So we fill some of the fluid, some of those containers up with oil because um, oil doesn't compress under pressure. We also use really strong materials. So instead of coffee cup material, you'd use something like titanium. Um, that ends up being really heavy, so we have to use special types of foam. Imagine this, we have a kind of foam, you know, squishy foam, like a mattress or, or a pillow, but a foam that can't be crushed by the pressure of the entire ocean. And we do that by making little tiny glass spheres. A circle distributes the pressure out all around it. So instead of just squishing fat flat like a pancake on a flat surface, it helps spread it out and share all of that squeezing force. So we use some of those types of engineering tricks. And we also, that's why our robots can't go deeper. All the materials we use are rated for 4,000 meters of pressure, two and a half miles of pressure. We'd have to use different materials if we wanted to go to six, eight, 10, or 11,000 meters. All right. All right. And let's maybe squeeze in one more question. Mrs. McKaig's group, do you guys have one more? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, we do. What's the most dangerous creature you ever saw in the water? Oh, the most dangerous creature. Um, me before I have my coffee in the morning. No? Uh, the most dangerous creature. Um, we haven't had a lot of very scary encounters. If you could imagine you're used to living in a very dark world that's quiet and suddenly a minivan sized robot with bright lights comes on, um, you may be a little bit cautious. And lots of animals in the deep sea are cautious um, because you know, you don't get ahead by doing silly things um, or dangerous things. So uh, we've had a few um, different interesting encounters, like when a shark bumped into ROV Hercules. He came right in, right into the camera and bumped in. You can see that one on Nautilus Live if you search for shark. But we haven't had anything attack the robots or anything like that. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much. It was great to have such a great group of classrooms in Canada uh, and the United States. Your questions were all awesome. And I hope you're all going to be little junior deep sea explorers now and head to the Nautilus website and check out some of the videos that uh, Megan told you about. And Megan, thank you so much for taking us on that journey and, and showing us that there is so much more to explore, so much to discover. And if you want to be an explorer, the ocean is the place. My absolute pleasure. It was so great talking with all of you. Keep exploring and I'll see you soon with more questions. All right. So uh, don't hesitate to send me some questions and I can pass them on to Megan. Or if you go on the Nautilus site and you see something really cool you want to comment on, uh, please do and I can forward those to Megan. But for now, I'm going to turn the microphones on. We'll let the classrooms get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you. So here we go. Nice and loud, everybody. <laughs> Always so good at that. Uh, Megan, once again, thank you for joining us. And then uh, tune in later today. We have a couple more hangouts and then a whole bunch more for the rest of the month celebrating amazing women in science, exploration, adventure, and conservation. So thanks, everyone. We're signing off for today. <laughs>